Swan's Way, Swan in Love, Part 6, by Marcel Proust. Ah, you've come too late, Madame Vidarang greeted one of the faithful, whose invitation had been only to look in after dinner. We've been having a simply incomparable brisho. You never heard such eloquence. But he's gone. Isn't that so, Monsieur Swan? I believe it's the first time you've met him, she went on to emphasize the fact that it was to her that Swan owed the introduction. Isn't that so? Wasn't he delicious, our Brichot? Swan bowed politely. No, you weren't interested? Madame Vidaram asked dryly. Oh, but I assure you, I was quite enthralled. He is perhaps a too... A little too preemptory, a little too jovial for my taste. I would like to see him a little less confident at times, a little more tolerant, but one feels that he knows a great deal, and on the whole, he seems a decent sort. The party broke up very late. Cotard's first words to his wife were, I have rarely seen Madame Vederon in such form as she was tonight. What exactly is your Madame Vederon? A bit of a demi-mondaine, huh? said Forcheville to the painter to whom he had offered a lift. Odette watched his departure with regret. She dared not refuse to let Swan take her home, but she was in a bad mood in the carriage, and when he asked whether he might come in, replied, Of course, with an impatient shrug of her shoulders. When they had all gone, Madame Vederon said to her husband, did you notice the way Swan laughed? Such an idiotic laugh when we spoke about Madame Latremoux. She had remarked more than once how Swan and Forcheville suppressed the particle de before that lady's name, never doubting that it was done on purpose to show that they were not afraid of a title. She had made up her mind to imitate their arrogance, but had not quite grasped what grammatical form it ought to take. Moreover, the corruptness of her speech overcoming her intransigent republicanism, she said once again, the de la tremoeur, or rather, using an abbreviation found in the lyrics of popular cabaret songs and the captions beneath caricatures which elide the de, de la tremoeur. But she corrected herself at once by saying, Madame la tremoeur, the duchess as Swan calls her, she added ironically, with a smile that proved that she was merely quoting and would not herself accept that least responsibility for a designation so naive and ridiculous. I don't mind saying that I thought him extremely stupid. Monsieur Vederon took it up. He's not sincere. He's a cunning fellow, always betwixt and between. He's always trying to run with the hare and hunt with the hounds. What a difference between him and Forcheville. There, at least, you have a man who tells you straight out what he thinks. Either you agree with him, or you don't. Not like the other fellow, who's neither fish nor fowl. Did you notice, by the way, that Odette seems so clearly to prefer Forcheville? And I don't blame her, either. And then, after all, if Swan wants to play the society man with us, the champion of duchesses, at any rate, the other man has got a title. He's still Comte de Forcheville. He added delicately, as though familiar with the history of that title. He were making a scrupulously exact estimate of its value. I don't mind saying, Madame Vederon went on, that he saw fit to utter some most venomous and quite ridiculous insinuations against Brichot. Naturally, once he saw that Brichot was well liked by us. In this house, it was a way of striking back at us, of ruining our dinner. I know his sort. The dear good friend of the family, who badmouths you all the way down the stairs as he's leaving. Didn't I say so? retorted her husband. He's simply a failure, a poor little wretch, envious of anything that's at all grand. Had the truth been known, there was not one of the faithful who was not more malicious than Swan. But the others would all take the precaution of tempering their malice with obvious pleasantries, with little sparks of emotion and cordiality. 
While the least indication of reserve on Swan's part, undraped in such conventional formulas as, of course I don't mean any harm by it, to which you would not deign to stoop, seemed perfidious. There are certain original and distinguished authors whose slightest boldness is thought revolting because they have not begun by flattering the public taste and serving up to it the commonplace expressions to which it is accustomed. It was in this way that Swan infuriated Monsieur Vederon. In his case, as in theirs, it was the novelty of his language that led his audience to suspect the nefariousness of his designs. Swan was still unconscious of the disgrace that threatened him at the Vederans and continued to regard all their absurdities in the most rosy light through the admiring eyes of love. As a rule, he had no rendezvous with Odette, at least most often, except for the evenings, but afraid she might grow tired of him if he visited her during the day as well, he would have liked at least to be held constantly in her thoughts, and so was constantly seeking a way of entering into them, but in such a way that would be agreeable to her. Even a florist's or a jeweler's window, he saw a plant or a gem that delighted him. He would at once think of sending it to Odette, imagining that the pleasure which it had given him would be felt also by her, and would increase her affection for him. And he would have it delivered at once to the Rue La Prouve's, so as not to delay the moment in which, as she received something from him, he might feel himself, in a sense, transported into her presence. He was particularly anxious that she should receive these presents before she went out for the evening, so that the gratitude that she would feel toward him might give additional tenderness to her welcome when he arrived at the Vedrans. Might even, for all he knew, if the shopkeeper made haste, bring him a letter from her before dinner, or herself in person on his doorstep, come on a little extraordinary visit to thank him. As in an earlier phase when he had tested Odette's nature for reactions of resentment, he sought now by those of gratitude to elicit from her intimate particles of her feelings, which she had never yet revealed to him. Often she had money difficulties, and hard pressed by Odette would beg him to come to her aid. He was happy to do this as he enjoyed everything that could give Odette a better idea of his love for her, or simply a better idea of his influence and of the usefulness that he might be to her. Probably if anyone had said to him in, at the beginning, it's your position that attracts her, or at this stage, it's your money that she's really in love with, he would not have believed it, nor would he have been greatly distressed by the thought that people supposed her to be attached to him that people felt them to be united by ties so strong as those of snobbishness or money. But even if he had thought that this was true, he might not have suffered on discovering that Odette's love for him was based on mainstays more lasting than charm or any attractive qualities that she might have found in him. Self-interest, an interest that would postpone forever the day when she might be tempted to bring their relations to an end. For the moment, while he lavished presence on her and performed all manner of services, he could rely on advantages not contained in his person or in his intelligence or in the exhausting effort to make himself attractive to her. And this delight at being in love, in living by love alone, of the reality of which he sometimes doubted, the price that in short he must pay for it as a dilettante in immaterial sensations, increased its value for him. Just as one sees people who are doubtful whether the sight of the sea and the sound of its waves are really delightful, become convinced that they are, as well as convinced of the rare quality and absolute detachment of their own tastes by renting for 100 francs a day a room in a hotel from which that sight and that sound may be enjoyed. One day, when reflections of this sort had brought him once again to the memory of the time when someone had spoken so of him to Odette as a kept woman, and when once again he had amused himself with contrasting that strange personification, the kept woman, a shimmering amalgam of unknown and diabolical qualities, said as in some apparition by Gustave Moreau, with poisonous flowers interwoven with precious jewels. With that Odette on whose face he had watched the passage of the same expressions of pity for a sufferer, 
resentment of an act of injustice, gratitude for an act of kindness, which he had seen in earlier days on his own mother's face and on the faces of friends, that, o that Odette, whose conversation had so frequently turned on the things that he himself knew better than anyone, his collections, his room, his old servant, his banker, who kept all his securities. The thought of the banker reminded him that he must shortly withdraw some money. And indeed, if, during the current month, he were to come less liberally to the aid of Odette in her financial difficulties than in the month before when he had given her 5,000 francs, if he refrained from offering her a diamond necklace for which she longed, he would be allowing her admiration for his generosity to decline. That gratitude which made him so happy and would even be running the risk of making her believe that his love for her as she saw it in its visible manifestations grow fewer had itself diminished. And then, suddenly, he asked himself whether that was not precisely what was implied by keeping a woman, as if, in fact, the idea of keeping could be derived from elements not at all mysterious nor perverse, but belonging to the daily and private routine of his life, such as that thousand-franc note, a familiar and domestic object, torn in places and mended with glue that his valet, after paying the household accounts and the quarterly rent, had locked up in a drawer of the old desk, from where Swan had retrieved it to send it with four others to Odette. And whether it was not possible to apply to Odette, since he had known her, for he never imagined for a moment that she could ever have taken money from anyone else before him. That word, which he had believed so wholly inapplicable to her, of kept woman. He could not examine the idea further, for a sudden onset of that mental lethargy which was with him congenital, intermittent, and providential, happened at that moment to extinguish all the light in his mind as instantaneously as at a later period when electric lighting had been everywhere installed it became possible to cut off all the electricity in a house his mind groped for a moment in the darkness he removed his glasses wiped the lenses passed his hands over his eyes but saw no light until he found himself face to face with a wholly different idea, namely that he must endeavor in the coming month to send Odette six or seven thousand francs instead of five, because of the surprise and joy that would give her. In the evening, when he did not stay at home until it was time to meet Odette at the Vedrans, or rather at one of the open-air restaurants that they liked to frequent in the Bois, and especially at St. Cloud, he would go to dine in one of those fashionable houses in which, at one time, he had been a constant guest. He did not wish to lose touch with people who, for all that he knew, might be of use some day to Odette, and thanks to whom he was often, in the meantime, able to procure for her some privilege or pleasure. Besides, his long habit of society, of luxury, had created in him, along with a disdain for them, a need for them so that when he had reached the point where the most humble lodgings appeared to him as precisely on par with the most princely mansions, his senses were so thoroughly accustomed to the latter that he would have been uncomfortable at being in the former. He had the same regard to a degree of identity that they would never have suspected for the families with modest incomes who invited him to dances on the sixth floor, stairway D, the door on the left. As for the Princess de Parme, who gave the most spent, splendid parties in Paris. But he had not the feeling of being actually at the ball when he found himself herded with the fathers of families in the bedroom of the lady of the house, while the spectacle of washstands covered over with towels and of beds converted into cloakrooms with a mass of hats and overcoats sprawling over their comforters gave him the same stifling sensation that nowadays people who have been used for 20 years to electric lighting derive from a lamp that is blackening in its chimney or of a smoking nightlight. If he were dining out, he would order his carriage for half past seven. While he dressed, he would be wondering all the time about Odette and in this way was never alone for the constant thought of Odette gave to the moments in which he was separated from her the same peculiar charms as to those in which he was, she was at his side. 
he would get into his carriage and drive off. But he knew that this thought had jumped in after him and had settled down on his knee like a pet animal that he might take everywhere and would keep with him at the dinner party, unobserved by his fellow guests. He would caress it, warm himself with it, and feeling a sort of languor sweep over him, would give way to a slight shuddering movement that contracted his throat and nostrils and was a new experience for him as he fastened the bunch of columbines in his buttonhole. He had been feeling unwell and sad for some time, especially since Odette had brought Fauchevige to the Vedrans, and Swan would have liked to go away for a while to rest in the country, but he could never summon up the courage to leave Paris, even for a day, while Odette was there. The weather was warm, the days were the most beautiful of the spring. And for all that he was driving through a city of stone to immure himself in a mansion, what was incessantly before his eyes was a park that he owned, near Combray, where at four in the afternoon, before coming to the asparagus bed, thanks to the breeze that was wafted across the fields from the Meseglise, he would savor as much fresh air beneath an arbor as by the bank of the pond, fringed with forget-me-nots and gladioli, and where, when he dined, red currants and roses, enlaced by his gardener, ran all around the table. After dinner, if he had an early appointment in the Bois or at St. Cloud, he would rise from the table and leave the house so abruptly, especially if it threatened to rain and make the faithful return home before their normal time, that on one occasion, the Princess de Leon at whose house dinner had been so late that Swan had left before the coffee came to join the veterans on the island in the Bois, observed, really, if Swan were 30 years older and had bladder trouble, there might be some excuse for his running away like that. But all the same, it's the height of impertinence. He persuaded himself that the, the delights of spring, which he could not go down to Cambrai to enjoy, he would at least find on the Ile des Signes, or at St. Cloud. But as he could think only of Odette, he would return home not knowing even if he had smelled the fragrance of the young leaves or if the moon had been shining. He would be welcomed by the little phrase from the sonata played in the garden on the restaurant piano. If there was none in the garden, the veterans would have taken immense pains to have a piano brought out either from a private room or from the dining room. Not because Swan was now restored to favor, far from it, but the idea of arranging an ingenious form of entertainment for someone, even for someone whom they disliked, would stimulate them. During the time spent in its preparation to a momentary sense of cordiality and affection, now and then, he would remind himself that another fine spring evening was drawing to a close and would force him to notice the trees and the sky. But the state of excitement into which Odette's presence never failed to throw him added to a mild feverish ailment which, for some time now, had scarcely left him. It deprived him of that sense of quiet and well-being which is the indispensable background to the impressions that we derive from nature. One evening, when Swan had accepted an invitation to dine with the veterans, and had mentioned during dinner that he had to attend next day the annual banquet of an old comrade's association. Odette had at once exclaimed across the table, in front of everyone, in front of Fauchevie, who was now one of the faithful, in front of the painter, in front of Cotard. Yes, I know. You have your banquet tomorrow. I won't see you then till I get home, but don't be too late. Although Swan had never yet taken offense at all seriously at Odette's demonstrations of friendship for one or other of the faithful, he felt an exquisite pleasure on hearing her thus avow before them all, with that calm immodesty, the fact that they saw each other regularly every evening. His privileged position in her house and her own preference for him that it implied. It was true that Swan had often reflected that Odette was in no way a remarkable woman. 
and in the supremacy that he wielded over a creature so distinctly inferior to himself, there was nothing that especially flattered him when he heard it proclaimed to all the faithful. But since he had noticed that to many men Odette seemed a ravishing and desirable woman, the attraction that her body held for them had awakened in him a painful longing to master her entirely, even in the smallest particles of her heart. And he had begun to attach an incalculable value to those moments spent in her house in the evenings, when he sat her on his knees, made her tell him what she thought about this or that, and he took stock of the only treasure, the possession of which still mattered to him on earth. And so, after this dinner, drawing her aside, he took care to thank her effusively, seeking to indicate to her by the extent of his gratitude the corresponding intensity of the pleasures that was in her power to bestow on him, the supreme pleasure of being to guarantee him immunity for as long as his love would last and he remained vulnerable from the assaults of jealousy. When he came away from his banquet the next evening, it was pouring rain and he had nothing at his disposal but his victoria. A friend offered to take him home in a closed carriage, and as Odette, by the fact of her having invited him to come, had given him an assurance that she was expecting no one else, he could, with a quiet mind and an untroubled heart, rather than set off thus in the rain, have gone home and to bed. But perhaps, if she saw that he seemed not to adhere to his resolution to end every evening, without exception, in her company, she might grow careless and fail to keep free for him just the one evening on which he particularly desired it. It was after eleven when he reached her door, and as he made his apology for having been unable to come away earlier, she complained that it was very late indeed. The storm had made her unwell. Her head ached, and she warned him that she would not let him stay longer than half an hour, that at midnight she would send him away. A little while later, she felt tired and wished to sleep. No Catalea then tonight, he asked. And I've been looking forward so to a nice little Catalea. And looking somewhat sullen and nervous, she replied, No, dear, no Catalea tonight. Can't you see? I'm not well. It might have done you good, but I won't insist. She begged him to put out the light before he left. He drew the curtains close around her bed and left her. But when he was at home again, the idea suddenly struck him that perhaps Odette was expecting someone else that evening, that she had merely pretended to be tired, that she had asked him to put out the light only so that he would suppose that she was going to sleep, that the moment he had left the house, she had lighted it again and had reopened her door to the person who was to spend the night with her. He looked at his watch. It was about an hour and a half since he had left her. He went out, took a cab, and stopped close to her house, in a little street perpendicular to that other street, which lay at the back of her house, and along which he used to go sometimes to tap on her bedroom window for her to let him in. He left his cab, the streets were all deserted and dark in this neighborhood. He walked a few yards and came out almost opposite her house, amid the blackness of all the row of windows whose lights had long since been extinguished. He saw only one, from which overflowed between the slats of its shutter, which seemed to be pressing out its mysterious golden pulp, the light that filled the room within, a light which on so many other evenings as soon as he saw it far off as he turned into the street, made him rejoice with its message. She is there, expecting you, and now tortured him with. She is there with the man she was expecting. He must know who. He slipped along the wall until he reached the window, but between the slanting bars of the shutters he could see nothing. He could only hear in the silence of the night the murmur of conversation. What agony he suffered as he watched that light in whose golden atmosphere was moving behind the closed sash the unseen and detested couple. 
as he listened to that murmur which revealed the presence of the man who would come after his own departure, the duplicity of Odette and the pleasures that she was at that moment tasting with him. And yet, he was glad he had come. The torment had been that had forced him to leave his own house had lost its sharpness when it lost its uncertainty, since Odette's other life, of which he had had at that first moment a sudden helpless suspicion, he now held there in the full glare of the lamplight, an unwitting prisoner in that room, into which, when he wished, he would enter to surprise and seize it. Or rather, he would tap on the shutters, as he had often done when he had come there very late, and thus at least Odette would learn that he knew, that he had seen the light and had heard the voices, while he himself, who a moment ago had been picturing her as laughing with the other man at his illusions, now it was he who saw them, confident in their error, tricked by none other than himself, whom they believed to be far from here, but who was there and knew already that he was going to tap on the shutter. And perhaps... What he felt, almost an agreeable feeling at that moment, was something more than the appeasing of a doubt and a pain. An intellectual pleasure. If, since he had fallen in love, things had recovered for him a little of the delightful interest that he had found in them long ago, but only when they were illuminated by the memory of Odette, now his jealousy revived another faculty from the studious days of his youth the passion for truth, but for a truth which, too, was interposed between himself and his mistress, receiving its light only from her, a very personal truth whose unique object, infinitely precious and one of an almost disinterested beauty, Odette's actions, her friends, her projects, her past. At every other period in his life, the little everyday words and actions of another person had always seemed wholly valueless to Swan. If gossip about such things were repeated to him, he would find it meaningless. And while he listened, it was only the lowest, the most commonplace part of his mind that was interested. At such moments, he felt utterly mediocre. But in this strange phase of love, the other person assumed something so profound that the curiosity which he could now feel aroused in himself to know the least details of a woman's daily occupations was the same which he had had long ago for history. And all those things that till now would have made him ashamed, spying outside a window, tomorrow perhaps putting adroitly provocative questions to casual witnesses, bribing servants, listening at doors, now seemed to him, just as were the deciphering of manuscripts, the weighing of evidence, the interpretation of old monuments, simply methods of scientific investigation with a genuine intellectual value and appropriate to the search for the truth.